Okay. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I guess I don't have to lean in. I could just, can everyone hear me like this? Okay, great. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me uh, to everyone at University of Houston, Victoria, who had something to do with it. And thank you, Dagoberto. It's always great to hear from you. And we got a chance to uh, ride down from the San Marcos area. And I was introduced to Bucky's today. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> It's a revelation. Just miles of beef jerky. I'm, I'm, I insisted we stop on the way home. So uh, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I thought we'd do things maybe uh, slightly differently because I, I just love to get to know the audience a little bit more and standing up here and blabbing away doesn't give me much of a chance to do that. So uh, what I thought I'd do is maybe read um, just three, three short sections, um, but take questions in between. I thought I would go back in time and maybe read a little bit about uh, whoops, Monkey Hunting, my third novel, a little bit from Lady Madagerish Hotel, and then give you a preview of King of Cuba, which is coming out next month. But to take questions kind of in between, uh, and that way we can start the conversation sooner rather than, rather than later. And then we're going to have a conversation on stage, um, and, you know, more, more formal, but this is kind of the informal part of things. Sound good? OK, so store up those questions. Don't be shy. OK. All right, so um, monkey hunting um, uh, began for me with a, with a question when I was maybe about five years old. And I was growing up in New York City, and my parents, uh, to, you know, to take, a, take the whole family out, five of us, for dinner was a bit prohibitive. But uh, there, was, there, were, there was a Cuban, actually several of these Cuban Chinese restaurants on the Upper West Side of Manhattan where we would often go for Sunday dinner. And it was just to me this miraculous place where the Chinese waiter would come over and speak to us in Cuban accent, it's Spanish. Uh, we would have a menu where on one side were all the Chinese specialties, on the other side all the Cuban specialties, and you could mix and match. I could get the chow mein with, with, um, you know, with the Cuban pork and black beans. I mean, it just sounds kind of horrible in a way, but it, for me as a child, I thought I died and gone to heaven. I could get all my favorite dishes on one plate. Um, but nobody could explain to me, well, why is it that this Chinese waiter can speak Spanish like a Cuban? And, you know, what is the history behind this? And, you know, my parents would say, oh, the Chinos were always in Cuba, as if, what? No, that, that couldn't have been. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that. But later, uh, I just decided to investigate, well, what, what about those Chinese in Cuba, in Cuba, and it turned out that they began arriving um, by the boatload beginning in 1848. Um, uh, as there was uh, abolitionist pressure, I mean, Cuba just brought in tons of slaves for the, for the sugar plantations. Um, they started looking for other sources of labor, and they had uh, British and Spanish agents in Asia trying to sign people up for these eight-year contracts, promising them the moon, uh, and then... Um, uh, and then, of course, they would end up uh, on the plantations as slaves, like everybody else. So this is the story of one of, one of those guys. So most of the book takes place in colonial Cuba. And two of his descendants, uh, including an Afro-Cuban Chinese guy who ends up fighting <laughs> for the Americans in Vietnam. Okay. So it starts in Asia, goes through the Caribbean, up to New York, and then back to Asia again in this episodic way. So I thought I would read a little bit maybe from him. Um, his name is Domingo Chen, uh, and he's in Vietnam. He's gone for a, I've just borrowed this book, so I have to see if I can find this here. Um, uh, and he's, and he's um, here we go. My book's got waterlogged on the way here because my uh, water bottle opened, and so the pages are all <laughs> stuck together, so I just borrowed the books from the lovely bookseller. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, here we go. So this is, takes place in Saigon, and it's 1970. Domingo's on a second tour of duty. And I can't find the section. All right, here we go. All right, I know it's in here somewhere. <laughs> I don't think they took out that chapter when I wasn't looking. Um, Oh yeah, no, that's Domingo. But I, he gets someone pregnant, this Vietnamese woman, and then there's. So I just wanted to read a little bit of a racier section. I mean, he's just toting around his 
machine gun at that point. And, and, uh, okay, so he gets this woman pregnant. <laughs> And then she makes him spread this sauce all over her body. I'm sure you want to hear this. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It was just all the fumes from the beef jerky just have got me crazy here. This, this is, we're having a magical realism moment. My chapter has disappeared, and I don't know where it is. Here it is. Yay! It was so far along in the book, I thought it was more in the middle. All right, thank you for your patience. <laughs> this is going to be an interesting ride. Uh, okay, Saigon, 1970. So Tom Tan Lan is the girlfriend. He is pregnant. And uh, one other thing you should know is that he comes from Guantanamo originally, which is, as you probably know, where the American air, uh, base is there, naval base there. His father worked for the Americans there, and his mother, uh, who is a midwife, comes from a long line of congueros, conga players. Okay, here we go. For the first few months of her pregnancy, Tam Tan Lan ate only bitter foods, pickled melons, quail eggs in salted vinegar, dirt and crusted roots she collected on the outskirts of town and boiled to make soups. She spread fish sauce on everything including the Neapolitan ice cream Domingo brought her from the PX. He offered her American treats, peanut butter and saltines, Oreo cookies, hamburger meat, but all these foods nauseated her. Now Tam Tan Lan kissed Domingo only if he smeared Nuke Mam on his lips first. To make love, he had to spread the fish sauce everywhere. I promised you that, didn't I? <laughs> Domingo tried to teach Tom Tan Lan Spanish, another language of the body. Mi reina, mi adoración, eres mi sueño. She said that they were having a boy and Domingo didn't doubt her. He taught her how to say, mijo, my son, but she wasn't interested in learning new words. He wanted to show Tom Tan Lan how to dance, but her hips resisted. I'm too tired, she said and settled down for another nap. Domingo went on a shopping spree, bought Tan Tan Lan things she didn't need, hair curlers and a waffle iron, lemon cake mix, and a brand new sewing machine that she sold for a fortune to a tailor who fitted uniforms for the Vietnamese Navy. He bought Tan Tan Lan a radio, but she made him return it. No more sound, she insisted, even turned down to a crackle music made her unbearably sad. Domingo couldn't get used to the silence, to the monotony of her sleeping. Soon he was hearing music everywhere, in the ping and hiss of the new teapot, in the percussive rumble of his stomach, ding, 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 ba-da, ba -di. Who was he without a little rhythm? His tío Demio had told him that during slavery days, drumming had been forbidden altogether. The sugar mill owners hadn't wanted their property getting overly excited and sending messages to slaves on other plantations. In those times, to own a drum, to play a drum, were acts of rebellion punishable by death. And so the drums and the drummers learned to whisper instead. The day Domingo brought Tom Tan Lan an electric fan, she told him that he would leave her ride horses in a place with blazing rocks and no trees, a landscape Domingo had trouble imagining. Then she turned on the fan and lay down in front of the artificial breeze. Behind her, the sticky curtains stirred. She dreamed of crabs, dead and rotting on riverbanks, their casings picked clean by seagulls and sand fleas. Tom Tan Lan recalled the summer the Mekong River died, how the fishermen's nets pulled only dead fish from its depths. Sometimes she woke up frightened, thinking a crab had replaced the baby in her womb. It moved like a crab, it ran sideways, she cried, until Domingo soothed her with fish sauce kisses, placed his hands on her belly and said, Mi amor, crabs don't kick like that. His mother had blamed the Yankees, or as the Cubans say, the junkies, uh, 
For every deformed baby she had delivered in Guantanamo, the infant born with an eye in his umbilicus, the hairdresser's triplets attached like paper dolls by their hands and feet. The American, she said, had dumped poisons into the Rio Guaso, contaminating the sugarcane fields, making the coffee trees redden with blight. One Easter, Mama had delivered a Haitian boy whose heart had steamed furiously outside his chest. A moment later, his tiny heart had exploded in her face like a grenade. So I'm jump ahead a little bit. Domingo knew from experience that pregnant women didn't act normally. He'd grown up around them. They'd sat in his mother's kitchen, splashing rum into their morning coffee, hunched together over the latest scandal, laughing raucously over men whom they'd ridiculed or lamented with such ferocity that it made Domingo ashamed to be a boy. His mother would see him blushing and say, Don't worry, mi cielo, this has nothing to do with you. The women had played Radio Mil Diez at top volume and danced with each other, colossal belly to belly, or pulled Domingo close and taught him how to cha-cha-cha. Ah, see, si, little papi, don't grind too much or the nice girls will refuse to dance with you. In this manner, he'd learned the secrets of women. Domingo heard of GIs taking their Vietnamese fiancés or wives home after their tour of duty. The army frowned upon this, did everything possible to keep the couples apart, more so if children were involved. A few men had killed themselves for the love of these whores, especially, I'm um, sorry, everyone said they'd been, quote unquote, goo dude, no cure for it except death itself. Stories drifted back to Vietnam of former bar girls waking up in Georgia, bleaching their hair, wearing blue jeans and cowboy hats renaming themselves Delilah. Other stories were sadder still, of underage girls dressed up like China dolls at their husbands' insistence, paraded around small towns in Texas or Mississippi, shopping for trinkets at Woolworths. Saddest of all were the suicides, the poisonings, the slit wrists, anything to set their souls free to fly home. Domingo wondered about these migrations, these cross-cultural lusts. Were people meant to travel such distances, mixed with others so different from themselves? His great-grandfather had left China more than a hundred years ago, penniless and alone. Then he'd fallen in love with a slave girl and created a whole new race. Brown children with Chinese eyes who spoke Spanish and a smattering of abaqua. His first family never saw him again. So I think I'll stop there. It gives you a little bit of taste. And thanks for your patience while I found the not missing chapter of this book. Uh, thank you. So uh, any questions so far? No? No questions? Dago. So you, you write from a male point of view. You write from a Vietnamese point of view, right? So how do you do that? What do you do? You do a lot of research? What, what is it? How do you perceive it? I built back espresso. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, I mean, I my first books were pretty female dominated, and I and I kind of feel like I can do the, the crazy woman thing with my eyes closed. Uh, so um, I think probably my, my biggest challenge is, was with the new book, King of Cuba, where I'm actually channeling Fidel Castro, El Comandante himself, uh, and one of his many nemeses, this octogenarian, kind of crazy octogenarian exile. Uh, and so I go back and forth between these sort of two titans, to, you know, 80-something-year-old men uh, who have very strong opinions about pretty much everything. Uh, and for me, um, I don't know whether it just took me that long to, to get to, to those men, but I, I don't really, um, uh, you know, at this point, I feel uh, it's not such a huge leap. You're still doing character. You still have to get in their bloodstream. You still have to imagine how they move in the world, how they... Um, you know, react to family or to or to the news or um, you know their intimate situations and and I think it, you know if you can imagine a Chinese guy in the 19th century or I can imagine um, 
you know, an Iranian woman during the revolution there, or, uh, you know, so many other kind of leaps and acts of imagination, uh, to, to leap into another gender, even someone like Fidel Castro, uh, is, is doable, you know, is manageable. It just probably takes a little bit longer, and, uh, you know, that kind of inhabiting or transitioning in and out is probably transitioning in is harder than transitioning out. I'm like fleeing, you know, at the end of the day. But, um, uh, but you have to have, I think, a degree of uh, sympathy and empathy for all your characters uh, in, in their complexities. Uh, and, and, you know, some of that is gender-based, but a lot of it, a lot of it is not. Um, although my daughter was saying when I was writing King of Cuba, she was in high school when I was starting it, that I was, I was uh, tending toward the dictatorial at home. This is because I didn't let her get her driver's license. Uh, Los Angeles. You can't drive in Los Angeles at 16, as far as I'm concerned, but that's another story. Um, but since I've talked about this, why don't I read from King of Cuba a little bit next? And, um, and since you, you're talking about the male thing, um, uh, does everyone here know what a pinga is? OK, pinga? Yeah, penis. OK, so, so just, just in case. <laughs> All right, because it's going to come up a lot in this section. All right. <laughs> See, you're so patient. Yes. Yes, yes, am I popping all the peace here? <laughs> okay. Is that better? Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> all right, so part of the fun with imagining El Comandante uh, was... Well, first of all, I should tell you, it was a total immersion program in El Comandante and Fidel Castro. I read everything that exists on him. I saw a lot of old footage. I watched countless hours of him giving speeches. I could do an imitation of him, but I, I won't, uh, you know, saddle you with that. Um, and, uh, and so, and I did all of that, but then I, then I shelved it. I mean, I did a year of, of research. Uh, it was like 24-7 Fidel Castro. And then, uh, and then I shelved it and, and still had to come up with the man, the man himself, the private man. And uh, one of the questions I asked, so I took great liberties, you know, with not so much with historical events, but with a lot of, the, you know, the personal historical events of his life. Gave him a different number of brothers and, you know, issues with his father, etc. cetera. But, um, but anyway, so, but I thought, how does, how do you, how do you uh, grow a dictator from the ground up? Like, what happens? <laughs> What does that entail, right? So this is just a very short section where uh, uh, El Comandante remembers seeing his dad walking out of the tub naked. Okay, so that's where the pinga part comes in. Um, anyway, the rest will speak for itself, I think. So um, El Comandante recalled his first vision at age four of Papa's prodigious pinga steaming like a locomotive after a hot bath, and flanked by grapefruit-sized balls, or so they'd seem to him, that hung confidently, hirsutely, where his thick thighs flared. That same evening, as his mother bathed the little despot-to-be, taking care to wash the pink butt of his manhood and dust it with enough talcum powder to make it look like a lump of sugar dough, he worked up the courage to ask, Mommy, Will all of me grow? His puzzled mother helped him into his calzoncillos before it occurred to her what he was asking. Ay, mijito, your pinga will be the greatest in the land, in all the Americas, perhaps the world. The boy was cautiously pleased. OK, the greatest, but will it also be the biggest? His mother grinned, eyes shining, and brought her lips so close to his that he inhaled the garlic from that night's ajiaco stew. Don't you doubt that for a second. The pint-sized tyrant's chest filled with pride, and he strutted off to bed with big dreams, the biggest of all. He imagined his pinguita growing and growing until it floated high in the skies, a massive flesh-toned dirigible draped with parachute huevones and a proud snout that served as the control room for the whole impressive operation. And that nobody, not even the junkies, with their warships and gun batteries, would ever dare shoot down. 
Good night, Niamor. His mother kissed him on the forehead and gave him an encouraging pat. Sleep with the angels. Good night, Mommy. And with that, the pint-sized tyrant rolled over and fell deeply, happily asleep. So you talk about imagining boys. <laughs> the tyrant as a toddler. <laughs> OK, uh, any questions now? <laughs> we should get things stirred up. I asked beforehand, would it be OK to read racy stuff? And, um, uh, and, and the answer I got was, well, it's better than dark, tragic stuff. So I said, OK, I'll, I'll give it a try here. <laughs> but I could read dark, tragic stuff, too. Any questions? Does that answer your question, Dago? Yeah, I mean, when someone's asking, so why, why make him feed in? Why, why are you just imagining Comandante and not naming him? Why are you? Oh, yeah, because why are you because a historical figure when Oh, because it's so much more fun to make stuff up. If if he were <laughs> <laughs> if he were a historical figure, I couldn't write a scene like that. Because how would I know about this? You know, I wanted to do ultimately um, a kind of archetypal strongman, Latin American strongman, Caribbean strongman. Of course, it's referring continuously to Fidel, to the Bay of Pigs invasion, to all of these historical events. <laughs> But I also wanted to um, kind of access, uh, you know, I, want, I wanted to have access, I think, to um, you know, some of the preoccupations and, um, and uh, internal life and uh, narcissism of the guy. Uh, and I, I think there have been many good books already written, many good biographies written of Fidel. But, but nothing yet that takes these uh, fictional liberties, that gets at him as a sort of, uh, I mean, it's hard to compete with Fidel the Man, with, Fidel, you know, with El Comandante fiction, because it's already so over the top. So, um, so sometimes it's in the more intimate moments that you get to take the more liberties, rather than his more public moments. And I had a great time doing that, uh, so obviously. So, so who, is, who is the other character? The other character, uh, and maybe I could read a little bit from him, uh, is Goyo Herrera, and he's, uh, he's also in his 80s, someone that knew Castro at the university uh, in the early 50s. Uh, and they have a little bit of history, but not much. You know, it's much bigger in Goyo's mind. I'm sure Comandante didn't even have a second thought about Goyo. Uh, and so he's in Miami, pretty much just biding his time uh, treating his various health ailments and just waiting for the son of a bitch to die, you know? <laughs> that, that's basically his goal in life at this point. I want to outlast him. And, uh, and Miami's a very strange place, you know, because it's the, the, the kind of the hotbed of the Cuban exile community. And, uh, you know, other cities might have all kinds of other emergency plans in case of a tornado or this or that. Miami actually has, uh, you know, the, the second El Comandante dies, the second Fidel Castro dies, they have a parade ready to go down, <laughs> like within minutes to go down Calle Ocho, which is the main drag of Little Havana. So it's not just Goyo's obsession, it is the obsession of this generation or a couple of generations of, of Cuban exiles. And so it's through Goyo that I, I access that kind of obsession. And, and for me, it was fascinating to do these two contemporaries, you know, one very famous, one an anonymous, you know, um, anonymous small business owner, uh, and, and, um, and, and also just see the, more of the commonalities and similarities and intractabilities of the two rather than their differences for all their you know, purported political distances. The way they behave and the way they act in the world are more similar than dissimilar. And so that, that fusion was intriguing to me to play, play with that. Beverly, did you have a question? Uh, is he called Fidel? No, El Comandante, or you know, just various other uh, monikers, but not never Fidel. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, is there any anger in your book to uh, change the tension between the two? Is there anger in the book? Is there any anger? It seems to me it's set in a very humorous kind of. Well, I would I call it kind of a darkly comic book, but but yes, there's a, a lot, uh, you know, a, a equal opportunity emotion here. Everybody, you know, there's a little bit of everything here. Yeah, a little bit of everything. I also, besides the two men, I have a series of um, vo other voices, Cuban voices, mostly on the island, who tell their story, who, um, who in, in effect, compete with and um, uh, 
skewer and contest uh, these official histories, you know, the one from Cuba and the one from the exile. And they're telling their own, own stories, sometimes directly related to, to the men and sometimes not. Um, maybe I'll read just a short one, uh, just to give you an idea. Um, there's one um, called uh, Galapagos. Let me see if I can find it. Um, this was actually a true story. I went to Havana. I went back to Havana in 2011 uh, for a few weeks with my daughter and a, a friend of mine who, who studies the visual arts there and got to meet this painter. Uh, so uh, this book is fiction, but this little section is actually true. And it's in the voice of, uh, I made up the name, Zayda del Pino, an artist, Galapagos. And these are the things that kind of intersperse the, the, the larger text. Uh, this is a very difficult country, very stressful. No quieren reconocer que esto es un fracaso, an utter disaster. I waited years for an apartment in Havana until I couldn't wait any longer. I built my own place in between these two old mansions in Vedado. It's gloomy and narrow, but I shift a spotlight around to where I'm painting y me resuelvo, which I resolve. At first, the authorities considered me a squatter. Then they tried to tax me out of existence. But I parked myself here and refused to move. I live with my kitty and a baby Galapagos turtle that a friend of mine smuggled out of Ecuador. Sometimes I take Piquito to the park so he can sun himself. They tell me my turtle will live 300 years and go to the size of a Volkswagen. But what's the use of worrying? Nobody knows what tomorrow will bring. If you chuck Piquito under the chin, like this, see, he bobs his head. Ah, he loves that. <laughs> My paintings? Naturally, they have a sinister air. They're my hallucinations, my nightmares. Right now, I'm working on a series called Buscando Carne en La Habana, looking for meat in Havana. Meat, of course, in all respects. It's these disgraces that I'm driven to paint with my medieval palette. One disgrace after another. There are never any shortages of those. So that's one of probably about 40 different voices that pepper the, the text. Um, uh, how are we doing time-wise? we have a few more minutes? You have a question? How many of those voices can you do? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I don't know. I mean, I mean, no. Wait, do you hear the voices while you're writing? And I do, actually, yeah. Cool. I do kind of hear them when I, I'm writing. And I, I also do, at one point or another, read everything aloud to my, you know, re literally read it aloud. If I weren't writing a novel, I'd be carted off, you know, by men in white coats. Uh, yeah, because it has to it has to sound. You know, there's a there's a music too that I that I hear, and I I will often just make editorial decisions based on this. This doesn't sound right, or this is too many adjectives, or you know, in this one sentence or whatever. Yes. Uh, do you find that uh, Spanish speaking cultures, American Spanish, uh, are uh, coming more together, or are the differences uh, keeping them uh, separate? Yeah, I understand my. You mean <laughs> you are the expert in that uh, because you came from urban Cuban Spanish and now you're here in Texas. So uh, yeah. how do those two groups inform one another? Yeah, um, uh, I, I think there's more, more and more conversations happening actually uh, over time. I think that's just getting easier as. Uh, I mean, two things are happening. I think the regionalism is getting both more entrenched and, and kind of more universal. So uh, people are very interested in, in preserving culture, preserving uh, you know, regional differences. But they're also interested in having bigger conversations. Um, uh, so uh, for example, uh, I actually edited two different kinds of volumes. One was on Cuban and Cuban, Cuban diasporic literature. But I also, and it was odd for a Cuban-American to do this, but I also edited a an anthology, actually, which Dagoberto Pierce uh, called uh, Bordering Fires, which was it, it about uh, Chicano, Chicano literature, uh, and as well as uh, Mexican literature. And so, so these kinds of conversations are happening more and more. There, there are many common, commonalities, but also very kind of crucial cultural differences that, you know, 
we respect and and um, and learn from. So, yeah, yeah, and it, and it's uh, interesting because we're always also getting replenished uh, with new immigrants and uh, or or people looking you know looking back, grand, you know, grandkids often looking to their grandparents for clues to who they are and what matters, <laughs> and so it's an ongoing conversation. Yes, hi. Well, that kind of ties into my question: How did your family influence you, and how do you tie in? To them, was your father a professional person or mother when you left Cuba and came here? I have all these questions. Yes, they were. Um, they left in the early, early wave. Uh, you know, there were a couple of early waves, and then things were closed off uh, shortly before. Um, shortly before the Bay of no, was it the Bay of Pigs or the Missile Crisis? It was uh, sixty one in the uh, spring of sixty one that that it was uh, became quite impossible to leave for a time, um, and so. Uh, yeah, my my uh, my father worked for his father, um, doing some ranching, cattle ranching. In fact, uh, I grew up in New York City, so that to me just feels like a, a world apart. And uh, and my mother was an accountant, and they ended up uh, and they ended up uh, just starting a s small businesses. And so I that, and so it started out as a kind of like a drugstore type of thing, and then they ended up with this uh, kind of big bakery restaurant. Um, and you, using us as slave labor, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, I, for the short order cook and waitress and can do all that stuff, flip pancakes. Uh -huh. This has nothing to do with your. Book. Are we done Excuse with? Excuse me. This, let me do one thing. Excuse me. Uh, it's twelve forty-five, so maybe the students can. Oh yes, I understand. Some of you have and, another yeah. class, Sorry, but thank you me. so much for coming, and I've been blabbing too much here. No, no, no. <laughs> I just want to make sure because they get fidgety. Of course, and of course, yeah. Okay. They probably won't ask questions. Anyway, All right, so. so. Good. You did good. Right. Finding yeah. the story, yeah. though, that's pretty. That's pretty. The freaky. what? Prank, finding the chapter. Is kind you know, of it's so uh, weird. How did it just disappear? How did it disappear? I misgaged it. I thought it was more <laughs> in the middle, and I kept looking in the middle. Yeah. That felt about like 20 minutes, but it couldn't have been that long. How old was I? Uh, uh, see, 61, two, two and a half, almost three. Uh -huh. So I don't, I don't remember any yes. of that. Yeah, but I did start going back. Um, when was my first trip? Was 19, I think 82 or three. So I think we're gonna have a conversation. Here at our first question for, for after the break. Here. Oh, okay, okay, great. Do I stand up here? Yeah, or we yeah, sit? we. You can uh, stand, you can address the audience. It's okay. a little quieter now. All right. Okay, so can you hear me if I step away Step away from the podium? If I step away from the podium? Okay. Yes. I'm just going to say what I have to say here is, has nothing to do with your books or your writing. I, I, I feel like one of the biggest blunders our country has made is the continuing embargo on Cuba. Um, travel restrictions and that sort of thing. It's pointless. Uh, do you feel that those restrictions will ever be relaxed and the the Yeah, I mean they, they kind of ebb and flow. They're not absolutely fixed, which is interesting. For example, they actually been uh, recently relaxed somewhat. I mean I actually didn't go to Cuba um, during Bush second's term because it was almost impossible to get to Cuba. Things got really tightened up then. And now it's easier uh, for me to get a license. Actually, it's not illegal to go to Cuba. It's illegal to spend any money in Cuba. Yeah. It's a technicality. So you actually have to get a license from the Treasury Department, and there's a lot of rigmarole. And, and it's, it's, uh, so they weren't giving those out for, for years. And, so, and now it's a lot easier to do it if you're an academic or you have research or, um, or humanitarian you know, you're with a humanitarian group or whatever. So it's not something that uh, it's absolutely fixed in stone. It does ebb and flow. Uh, and people get around it through third countries and uh, other kinds. But yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, who said that the, the definition of, of crazy is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? Mm -hmm. That's the embargo. Right. You know, it hasn't helped. If anything, I think it hasn't helped in terms of policy. It has helped, I think, um, Castro stay in power because it's a sort of uh, David and Goliath situation. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. 
Yes. What influence does religion have in your writing? Like, Dreaming in Cuban, for example, has a very, that sort of native religion. Santeria. Yeah. Yeah. So how does, like, say, the Catholic Church and those kind of more Christian denominations have with your writing? Yeah. I think they, they, uh, they definitely permeate, especially in, um, especially in the er earlier works. Uh, I didn't grow up with Santeria, um, but I became very intrigued by it when I started returning to Cuba on a regular basis. And I also had lived in Miami for a while, and it was kind of in the air. Um, Santeria, for those who don't know it, is a syncretism between the Yoruba religions of the slaves who were brought over to Cuba and Catholicism. Uh, the slaves were not allowed to practice their religions, and so on the surface, they converted and they were Catholics and, and learned all that ritual, but ben beneath kind of the topography of the Catholicism, um, the uh, Yoruba religions remained alive and strong, and in fact, it was kind of very secretive uh, until, until I would say, the last 30 years or so where it's come out of the closet a little bit. But, but the syncretism is fascinating because all the, say, the, the pantheon of uh, Catholic saints have dualities you know, with, with uh, the African uh, deities. And, uh, it, it's at, and I've studied it quite a bit. Probably the book that I, I explored it most in was my second novel, The Aguero Sisters. There's a lot of Santeria in that. Um, but it's a, big, it's, a big part of, uh, it's a big part of Cuban culture. In Cuba, is it still that way? Uh, yes, it's not so secretive, but uh, I would say Santeria is, is alive and well in Cuba and in Miami as well and, and other places. Yeah. And, and Texas too, by the way. Okay, <laughs> all right. Are you a Santero by any chance? No, no. I'm a Catholic priest. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we've outed him. <laughs> I thought, okay. <laughs> There's an agenda here. What is it? Who is this guy? All right. <laughs> yes. Have you met Anya Sanchez? Who? Anya Sanchez, no. she was featured on PBS. Oh, okay. The freedom she writes about uh, the Cuban Oh, people. Yoani Sanchez. Yoani yes, Sanchez. Sorry, yes, sorry. yes. Yoani. Have you met her? I have not met her, but... Um, she was featured last night. Oh, Where was she? Oh, yeah, she's fascinating. And um, she actually has a, a, a couple of books, but I read one that was a collection of the blogs she, she has done in the past that are invaluable, just in terms of getting a feel for the life of everyday Cubans, you know, okay. what they're talking about, what they're preoccupied by. And she's sort of a gadfly. Uh, I mean, they don't know really what to do with her because she's so famous now. And they don't, they've tried to shut her down in various ways, right. her computers, but she always finds a way to get, get her blogs out. And she has a huge following. Um, do you think that's why they've not uh, disposed of her? Yeah, I think so. She's too high profile. Do people still get uh, disposed of? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, people get silenced in various ways, and probably the most insidious way is um, is self censorship because out of fear, you know. Yeah. And in fact, there's quite a bit about that in King of Cuba. You know, uh, Fidel, the El Comandante. Um, you know, the way they strategize, the way the revolution ha has has um, has done that. I find of all the different artists in Cuba, uh, I find that the visual artists somehow are the are the freest. You know. Yeah. And uh, the writers are very uh, on very tight leashes, but the visual artists—it's like they don't like the officials don't get the art, and so they're <laughs> they're really kind of I ignorant about the visual arts. And so the visual artists get away with murder. I mean, I look at it, I'm like, oh my god, do they not see what's happening? Uh, and so for me, that's where the most vibrant cultural production is happening there, and in theater too. No one seems to go to the theater. Those officials don't seem to go to the theater. So there's very interesting theater and very interesting visual arts. And that's pretty much what I focused on when I was last in Cuba, just getting to know those worlds. It was great. How people revolt, couldn't they? Because um, they seem sati not satisfied, but as long as they're fed and educated, it's free, didn't they? Yeah, and it's not, it's she not a... a little about it's that. Scary. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, I think it would have happened were it, were it destined to happen. I don't think it will happen now. I mean, right now, what I hear, what I heard on the street, and things change there on a day-to-day -day basis, but what I heard on the street, the, the phrase that I kept hearing was, cerraron la bolsa, which means like the treasury is down, there's like, this is kaput, and people are just waiting, and, the, and, and I heard a lot of references to the quote-unquote gerontocracy uh, in Cuba, so they're just pretty much waiting 
uh, it's on its last gasp, and they're waiting for it to. to um, yeah, yeah. I mean, they announced a few months ago that, uh, or maybe even more recently than that, Raul was going to step down in five years, and they had a young person who was going to take over. The young person was only like three years younger than he was. So, you know, oh. there. <laughs> And there was this very funny cartoon that was circulating um, when the Pope stepped down. And, it's, and the cartoon is with you know, Fidel Castro just sort of walking along and talking to an advisor saying, and he, do you believe he resigned and he's still so young? You know? and, uh, so yeah, I mean, there's no shortage of, uh, there's no, there's no shortage of uh, irony and, and uh, yeah, I mean, the Cubans are very funny, so they make, they make fun of everything as it's going on. And, and even the, uh, they have a, a musical group called Los Ban Ban. Maybe some of you have heard of it. They're like the Cuban Beatles. Um, but, but anything, that's the, other, the music also will pick up on these trends and these obsessions and, 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 and what's happening in the, in the lingo and turn it around very quickly. And, and, uh, the, the language is fascinating to go there. It feels like a new language every time I go. And um, when I first went back to Cuba in the early 1980s, I was speaking my parents' generation Spanish. So imagine someone being blasted into the past, you know, let's say from, from, um, from the beat era, and they're going groovy, man, you know, or what? I went back. And I opened my mouth, and the first thing my aunt did was call all her neighbors in to hear me talk, because no one had heard that Spanish in decades. You know? So it's a living thing. And um, I just hope that the Cuban people will have a big say in what happens, that it won't all be dictated by, by the exiles, by the people who have not been living there and suffering there all these years. Uh, I mean, everyone has a claim, but yes? Would you, would you ever write a book from your, you know, from your like a political or book? No. Your experience uh, growing up Cuban American. Uh, yeah, that my first book is that I would say, Dreaming in Cuban. Is your first book? Dreaming oh, in Cuban. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's uh, in that book. It's uh, it looks at a, a family. It focuses on the women of one family and what happens uh, to their relationships uh, over time in the wake of the Cuban Revolution. Uh, and it's a family divided very much like my own. Um, all of my father's family came to the States, plus my mother, and then all of my mother's family stayed behind in Cuba by choice. So it was a very, very bitter political schism. Uh, and I think that's why I ended up studying political science and doing that, because I, I was trying to make sense of that. How could you not talk to your mother for 20 years? You know, Maybe a week, but not, not 20 years. I, yeah. I just wondered, because I've, I've read two books by Carlos A. Oh, yeah, Waiting for Snow in Havana. Yeah. And I haven't read the second one. In, yeah. In Miami, I think. Yeah. And so those books are very, obviously, very well. Yeah, yeah, those are memoirs. Yeah, yeah. 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 I wondered if you, know, you might write a similar book. No, I think but for me, fiction is the way to do it. From your growing up in New York, you, you didn't have these, you didn't harbor these feelings. That, that uh, I grew up in the, in the wake of my parents' terrible dislocation and. Um, so I, I think I was downwind from that. But I myself, since I came when I was tiny, you know, didn't suffer that directly, but very indirectly through, through them. You know, they were felt very, very displaced. I think he was already about 11 or 12 when Yeah, when yeah. Yes? Another question. Going back to your writing style, most of your novels that I've read, I haven't read all of them, are what I would call character-based novels. So plot is not a huge piece for you. Did you ever venture into that? and let the plot pull the story more than the character pull the story? Or is there a novel that you have out that I have not read that does that? Because I imagine children's books, I didn't read any of your children's books, yeah. but children's books usually have to have that plot. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, the, uh, the uh, my books are never plot-driven, necessarily. They're more language-driven, character-driven, as you said. Uh, and then sort of the plot and what happens emerges organically in that in that process of exploring character. Um, and, and so, um, no, I mean, I, I, I couldn't imagine, I don't know, I never say never, but like writing some Cuban thriller or, you know, something, um, a screenplay or something that might be, necessitate that kind of plotting. Uh, for me, it's, it's discovery. I always go into, into a book with, with questions uh, and, and up, you know, the other side with even more questions than I started with usually. Um, so uh, that's it's just not how I operate. Uh, but there's lots of 
lots of people who do that to so create how success. Fit this into like a children, children's book. Children's book for for me. Uh, uh, I mean, I suppose you could you could plot them, but they didn't come in a plotted way. They came in vo with voice. Um, Except for the picture book, the, uh, the, there's a middle school book and then there's a young adult book. And they're driven by uh, fir first person narratives, sometimes multi-voice narratives. And for me, it was all about the voice, the voice, the voice, the voice. Um, you know, the voice of a 13-year-old in the middle grade school and then the, the, these older girls that alternate between three girls. Um, so, uh, but, but yeah, there's, you know, there are many ways. I mean, I know literary, literary writers who, who do plot, who do plan things out, and, and that works for them. Uh, it's, not, it's never really quite worked for me. I don't, which is funny because I came from journalism, and maybe I'm just re resisting that because th those are very structured, very formulaic. Yeah, and, and, um, but it's not what I do. Yeah. Any other questions? So who are all you guys? What are you doing here? <laughs> You're from the community and uh, supporting this program, and that's wonderful. Thank you. Yay for, yay for you. Okay. Yay for you. Oh, all right. <laughs>